Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back to the proof that Islam is the truth. And we're talking about the fascinating subject of the witnessing of the people of the book. And today also we're going to be dealing with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Bible. But let's continue where we left off last time in the last episode where we were talking about some stories of those people from the Jewish community who recognized the prophethood of Muhammad. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. And we talked about Abdullah ibn Salam. He was very famous. I will tell you a story from my own personal experience. Years ago, I used to spend every Sunday afternoon in a place called Speaker's Corner. Speaker's Corner is on the corner of Hyde Park in London. And there is a place there where you can stand up and you can speak about anything you like. Well, I, for 10 years, used to go down there and speak about the religion of Islam. And in my years down there, I got to know a Jewish rabbi. He was a very nice man. He used to listen to me and he was always very polite and talked about Islam in a very nice way. And one day during one of our conversations after some years, I thought that it was about time I should invite him to Islam. So I said to him, you know, my friend, we have been talking now for many years and even you have admitted to me that Muhammad is a prophet. So why then do you not embrace Islam? He said to me, we Jews, we never change our religion. I said, but half of the rabbis of Medina became Muslim. He said, that is true, but still, we Jews never change our religion. I thought, what can I say to him? So I said to him, you know, my friend, wouldn't you like to go to paradise and to be married to one of the beautiful, wide-eyed virgins of paradise? Now, he was a bit of an old man, but when I said that, he got a bit of a twinkle in his eye, I have to say. <laughs> and he looked like he might have been tempted. And then he looked at me and he said, no. He said, all we Jews want to do is conquer. I said to him, even if that's what you want, is it not true that the victory is only from Allah and by obeying him? He looked at me and said, listen to me, my friend. God sent to us a prophet Moses and we didn't even listen to him. Do you think we're going to listen to another prophet after him from another tribe, from another people when he said that? I had nothing left to say. He knew that Muhammad was a prophet. In fact, another rabbi also came up to me and he said to me, we know Muhammad is a prophet. And he quoted to me a passage from the Bible. And that's something I'm going to get back to right now, because what I want to mention and what I want to talk about is some of the verses in the Bible that really seem to show and illustrate that direction that we've been talking about. Because one of the things we're interested is in seeing, okay, that it's clear that there were Jews and Christians in the time of the Prophet Muhammad and until today, and I have to say including myself, that have been influenced by their reading of the Bible to accept Muhammad as a prophet. Now a person may say, how can that be? If we can accept that the Bible is not the actual word of God, if we accept a more accurate understanding of the Bible, that it really is a mixture of things. It's a mixture of history. It's a mixture of some things that are clearly the words of God. And it has been corrupted and distorted. And, and this is something that actually is quite agreed about even by some Christian scholars. Maybe we could call them secular Christian scholars, but they at least stem from the Christian civilization. And some of them even do call themselves Christians. So if we accept that, and we don't say that the Bible is the word of God absolutely, then we do have room for looking at some of the statements in the Bible that really do seem to indicate and very clearly point us in the direction that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah that has been foretold in that scripture. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through a few of those statements in the Bible and let's see what we think about it. Now, first of all, Let's start with Abraham. We're starting with Abraham because Prophet Abraham, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, is a prophet that is recognized by both Jews and Muslims and Christians. That's why some people call him 
the father of the three Abrahamic faiths. The one prophet that all Muslims, Jews and Christians have in common is this great prophet of God, Abraham. And Abraham is mentioned many, many times in the Quran and his religion is mentioned as the true religion. And the Quran says, who turns away from the religion of Abraham except someone who is foolish and has become foolish. So the religion of Abraham and Abraham himself is pointed to as a very great example of how a person should live their life in obedience to God. Now it's interesting that in the book of Genesis, where something of the, Abraham of, uh, the story of Abraham is mentioned, in the 12th chapter in Genesis, in verses 2 to 3, it mentions, And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make your name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It's a very interesting passage. Now this is before Abraham has any children. God is promising that he is going to bless Abraham and bless the people who bless Abraham and that all the families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. First of all, look at this great honor that God had bestowed upon his friend Abraham. And the Quran says that Abraham is the Khalil of Allah, like the close friend, the intimate of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how Allah has honored Abraham, even though it is said that he was the only person on earth who truly believed in God when he was alive. He was the only Muslim, the only person who truly believed in Allah for a time. And even though he was all alone, and there was no one else, and then obviously his wife Sarah and his cousin Lut and Hajar and his sons, and you know, so it didn't end like that. For a time, that's how it was. Yet Allah honored Abraham. And until this day, he is a person who is honored and remembered. I think if we were to mention any actor from Rome or Greece or any singer from those times, you would not be able to mention even one name of the Roman, Greek, or Babylonian actors or singers. But if we mention the name of Abraham, his name is known almost everywhere. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed honor and dignity upon his followers. Anyway, let's go back to that verse in Genesis, those couple of verses in Genesis 12, 2 to 3. Uh, I will make thee a great nation. First of all, when God is talking in the Bible, or when God is talking at all about greatness, as I have already indicated, greatness and honor does not mean merely in numbers. Greatness and honor in the criterion of God means a nation of people who obey God and follow God's commandment. This is what makes someone great with God. This is why Abraham is so honored because he was so obedient to the Creator. And this is why Allah honored him and elevated him until this day. So when God says to Abraham, I will make a great nation, that means he will make him that nation great in respect to their obedience to God and their following the commands of God. It would be an illusion to think that God is only talking about great in terms of numbers. Numbers are not important when it comes to God. What is important is that people obey him and worship him and follow his commands. That is what is important. And it's interesting that he says, God says, I will make you a blessing and I will bless those that bless thee. So let me ask you, my dear viewers, who are the people who bless Abraham? Well, I don't know how much you know about the Muslims and the five daily prayer of the Muslims. But one of the things that Muslims say in their prayer is Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa a'la ali Muhammad kama salaita ala Ibrahim wa a'la ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. O oh Allah, bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad as you blessed Abraham and the family of Abraham verily you are the praised and the majestic. So it is here in the Muslim prayer, 
five times every day that we are sending blessings upon Abraham and the family of Abraham. And God says that he will bless those who bless Abraham in Genesis 12 verses 2 to 3. And I don't think you'll find any nation of people blessing Abraham quite as much as the Muslims. In fact, every time we hear Abraham's name or we say Abraham's name, we say alayhi salam, which means may the peace and the blessings of God be upon him. So this is one of the statements in Genesis and we're going to be going back to some more statements in the Bible that could lead us to understand how it is prophesying the coming of the final messenger Muhammad. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. Don't go away. Join us after the break for more proof that Islam is the truth. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the proof that Islam is the truth. And we're talking about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet Muhammad in the Bible. Some prophecies, some foretelling, some statements in the Bible that we think could have been those statements that led Jewish rabbis and Christian priests and scholars to recognize that Muhammad, until today, that Muhammad is what he claimed to be, the last and final messenger of Allah. And we were talking about Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, where God was saying how he will make a great nation out of the progeny and the offspring of Abraham. You will make them into a great nation and bless them and bless the people who bless Abraham. And I was telling how the Muslims regularly send blessings upon Abraham. In fact, no one, I don't think, sends as many blessings upon Abraham as the Muslims do. Now, it's very important to understand something in the story of Abraham, and that is the birth of his two sons. Abraham had two sons. One was Ishmael and the other was Isaac. Now, the very first son of Abraham was Ishmael, and Ishmael was born to his wife, Hajar. And I emphasize his wife, because in fact, Abraham was married to Hajar, as is confirmed in the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet, and also in the Bible. The Bible also tells us that Abraham did marry Hajar. So Ishmael is in fact the very first son of Abraham. And in Genesis 17, in the fourth verse, it says, My covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. And in Genesis 21, 13, God promises that of the son of the bond woman, Will I make a great nation because he is thy seed? Let's do that again. Genesis 21, 13. The son of the bondwoman, meaning this is Hajar. The, the bondwoman is Hajar. She was originally a slave to Sarah. Sarah gave Hajar to Abraham to marry as his wife. And from that marriage came Ishmael. And God says... In Genesis 21:13, if it indeed it is from God, of the son of the bondwomen, I will make a great nation. Now, if you remember, we were talking about what is a great nation in God's terms. It doesn't just mean numbers. It must mean a pious nation, a nation of people who believe in God because he is thy seed. And again, in Genesis 21, verse 18, arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand for I will make him a great nation. And it is known that the Arabs are the descendants of Ishmael. In fact, the Bible calls the Arabs Ishmaelite. The Ishmaelites are the Arabs. So the Arabs are in fact cousins of the Bani Israel or the children of Israel. They are cousins. And according to the Quranic tradition, of course, that we believe that Ishmael was a prophet of God. And Abraham and Ishmael together built the Kaaba as a place to worship the one God alone. So it seems that Jesus here is foretelling that the scepter will pass from the children of Israel. The stone that is rejected, meaning Ishmael, will in fact become the cornerstone, the very corner, the very thing that holds monotheism together. 
since the Jews have rejected him as the Messiah, therefore the covenant will end with them and it will be passed on to the descendants of Ishmael. Now at the time of Jesus it seems very clear, at least according to the Gospels anyway, that the Jews were expecting three particular personalities. And they show this in their questioning of John the Baptist. And this is mentioned in the Gospel of John in the first chapter in the 21st verse. It's, they ask, are you the Christ? They're asking John, are you the Christ? Are you Elias? Are you that prophet? So it's very clear that there's three distinct individuals that they're asking about. The Messiah, Elias, who is supposed to come again, and that prophet. Now Jesus, who is of course the Messiah, he says that John the Baptist was in fact Elias. He, of course, is the Messiah that only leaves that prophet. Who is that prophet? It means they were expecting a particular prophet. And it is very, very clear that they were talking about who is not the Messiah and who is not Elias, he's a different personality, is the prophet referred to in the prophecy of Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. Let's read it. And the Lord said to me, they have spoken that which they have spoke, and I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them, and he shall command them. So here God is telling Moses, I am going to raise up a prophet who is like you, Moses. This prophet will be like unto you, and he and I will raise him up from amongst their brethren. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them what I shall command them. And the prophecy continues with a very stark and severe warning. And it shall come to pass that whosoever does not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will take vengeance on him. So God is warning severely that he is going to send a prophet. He will be like Moses. He will speak in God's name. He will say what he has commanded, and the people who do not follow him, then God will requite them, and God will take vengeance on those people if they don't follow him. This is Deuteronomy 18. So this is very clearly that prophet. This is the prophet that they were expecting. So the Messiah had come, Elias had come, but there's one prophet still left to come. That prophet, the one prophesied in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Who is that prophet? Who is that prophet that has been prophesied in 1818? Let's ask a question. It says from amongst their brethren, who are the brethren of the Beni Israel? We get a clue to this in Genesis chapter 16 verse 12 and also Genesis 25 verse 18. Both of these reverses refer to the Israelites as brethren of the Ishmaelites. So in the Bible itself, the Ishmaelites are referred to as the brethren of the Israelites. And the Hebrew dictionary of the Bible, it defines brethren as personification of a group who were regarded as near kinsmen of the Israelites. So it is very clear that from amongst your brethren means that God is going to raise a prophet who will be like Moses from the Ishmaelites and he shall speak in my name and whatever he says he does what he has commanded. Let's just read a very interesting extract from the Collins Dictionary of the Bible and it says here and this is a very nice interesting book what the Bible says about Muhammad you can see it on the internet and you can get it from many different places and let's read what it says here. As a statesman and lawgiver, Moses is the creator of the Jewish people. He found a loose conglomeration of Semitic peoples, none of who had ever been anything but a slave, and whose idea of religion were a complete confusion. He led them out and he hammered them into a nation with a law and a national pride and a compelling sense of being chosen by a particular God who was supreme. Wait for it. The only man in history 
who can be compared even remotely to him is Muhammad. There it is. Dictionary of the Bible. The only person who can remotely be compared to Moses is Muhammad. From the brethren of the Israelites, God is going to raise up a prophet. Every time the Quran starts a new chapter, it begins, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And what does Deuteronomy 18:18 18, 18 say? He shall speak in my name. The words that I will say, he will speak them. The Quran says the Prophet Muhammad does not speak from his own desire. It is nothing except a revelation that is revealed. When the Prophet spoke about Allah, when he spoke about God, he did not speak from his mind. He didn't invent things for himself. He spoke what God had commanded him, just as it had been prophesied in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Certainly, Jesus is not like Moses. Jesus was born miraculously, without a father. Muhammad and Moses both had natural fathers. Jesus was cared for by his mother. Both Moses and Muhammad were orphaned from a young age. Jesus was actually a follower of the Mosaic law, whereas Moses brought a new law. And also Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may God's peace and blessings be upon his, both of his prophets, all of his prophets. They also, he also brought a new law. Moses was expelled, Muhammad was expelled. Moses was both a leader of his people and a one who was receiving revelation, a prophet. Similarly, Muhammad was also a leader of his people and also a prophet. And so we, I'm just giving a few examples, but when we compare Moses and Muhammad, we can see that both these prophets are so similar. Who else fits that description? From the brethren, from the Ishmaelites, like unto Moses. And of course, both of them preach that there is only one God. You should only worship the one God. God is not like anything in this creation and you should submit yourself to God's divinely revealed law. This is what Moses taught. This is what Muhammad taught. And as we believe, of course, this is what Jesus taught. Here are some amazing statements to show you indeed that Muhammad is the one foretold in the Bible. So don't forget to join us for our next episode of the proof that Islam is the truth. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon all of you and may he guide all of us closer to the truth.